This is the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. Now, before we dive into today's episode, I wanted to let you know that the latest book from Craig is available on Tuesday, February 7th, and it's called Divine Direction, Seven Decisions That Will Change Your Life. Inside the book, Craig will walk you through seven principles to help you make better decisions, to connect you with God, and take steps to living the life you've only imagined. It's available on Tuesday, February 7th, but you can pre-order the book today by going to the website divinedirectionbook.com. Now, with that being said, let's join up with Craig Rochelle for another episode of the Leadership Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. Today, we're covering part two of the content, Creating an Empowering Culture. Creating an empowering culture. We are crazy passionate about empowering leaders. The best leaders don't gather followers, they empower leaders. If this content is helpful to you, there's a couple things you can do for me that would mean a lot. Um, First of all, you can rate or review this on iTunes. And sharing it on social media is really, really helpful. I work hard to give you valuable content in a concise manner. And anytime you help get the word out, I'm really, really grateful. If you're a first time listener, there's a whole year worth of content. You can go back and listen to uh, previous episodes. Uh, We release these every first Thursday of the month. If you're interested in receiving the notes, you can go to life.church slash leadership podcast. There's a place you can click on there. Give us your email. We'll send you the notes uh, every single month. If you have any questions, comments, thoughts, ideas, you can email me anytime at leadership at life.church. Each month, I like to answer a few of the best questions, and at the end of the teaching, I'm going to give you some application questions. We don't just hear, we put into action what we learn. So uh, let me dive into a couple of questions. This first one comes from Justin. Really good question. Justin asks, as a supervisor, I find it difficult to terminate or discipline a team member because I know my decision has a use effect um, on his or her personal life. Even though a team member may be toxic to the organization, I still care about them. What advice do you have for me? So, Justin, I get this. So many of us have this problem. You've got a toxic team member, a challenge. You need to discipline or you may need to remove that person, but you care about them so you don't know what to do. Uh, Let me give you a couple of thoughts, and this is really, really important um, that we all need to embrace this as leaders. To be an increasingly effective leader Uh, we have to grow in this area. And I can tell you this right now, to be an increasingly loving person, we have to grow in this area. And I want you to hear that. It's not just being a good leader to have the difficult conversations, but it's actually being very loving to have the difficult conversations. And Justin, I've never met you, but I, I know this about you. Not only do you care for your troubled team member, the one that you may be called toxic, but you also care for the other healthy, productive ones, don't you? Of course you do. You care for all of them. And I just want to say this, not dealing with the toxic one is being very unloving to the healthy ones. You have to think of it that way as well. If you're not dealing with the problem team member, you're actually very, you're insulting all the healthy ones who are showing up, getting the job done, and bringing their best game. So here's what I changed about my mindset that may be helpful. Having a developmental or a disciplinary conversation is not an uncaring thing. Not having that conversation is actually an uncaring thing. Why? Because when you truly care about a person, you care enough to tell them the truth. If you care about this person, you may have to say, your performance is not adequate. Your attitude is hurting the team right now. Your future, if you continue on this path, is very uncertain in our organization. That is the caring thing to do. When you have this conversation, let me give you some thoughts. Be specific about what needs to improve. Don't just say you need to get better. You need to get better at what? Be very, very specific. Give a fair deadline to see the specific detailed necessary improvement. Then give them the tools, the resources, the training, whatever they need to give them a chance to improve. Then meet with them regularly to monitor the progress. Then at the end of this process, what do you do? You either celebrate the growth. Guess what? Congratulations. You've done it. You've gotten better. You're, you're awesome. I'm so happy. Or you make a change. That's what's fair. 
That's what's loving. That's what's fair to your team member. That's what's fair to the other team members. That's what's fair and loving to your whole organization. If you have a problem person, it's your responsibility as the leader to help them improve or to make a change. And let me just say it as lovingly as I can to you, Justin. If you don't deal with a problem team member, the problem team member is no longer the problem. You are now the problem. That's the leader's call and the leader's responsibility. Another question, Ben asked this. Ben's a pastor. He said, as a young pastor, I know it's vital that I get regular constructive feedback on everything from how I preach to how I lead, even how I follow. How do I increase the constructive feedback I receive and raise the temperature on this in our culture? Great, great question. First of all, Ben, we have to understand that all feedback is not created equal. There are some people who will be way more helpful there's some people who might even be hurtful in their feedback. The problem is when you go to seek feedback, you don't know who's going to be helpful and who's not. So I'll give you three quick suggestions. First suggestion, I'd say this has been um, ask a few hand-picked people for specific feedback. Select a few, maybe three, four, five people that you think might be good and ask them for specific feedback. Now, what do I mean by that? Don't just ask them for feedback, let's say after you speak, what did you think about that? But ask them for specific feedback before you speak that you're gonna get after you speak. For example, you might say, hey, I want you to watch my talk and then tell me, were my transitions easy to follow? Um, what did I do that was distracting? Notice I didn't say, did I do anything? But assume you probably did. What did I do that was distracting? Uh, what are the three most effective things that I did? Uh, what are three things I could do to make my talk even more effective? Whatever it is, ask, give them those specific questions on the front end and then have them review you and give you feedback on the back end. Second thing would be this, uh, narrow it down to the people that are most helpful. So maybe you ask seven the first time, then find your trusted three and get a team of people that regularly give you feedback. They're gonna get better at it. You're gonna help them know what's helpful to you and you can create a team of people that consistently give you feedback uh, and, and then ask them for regular feedback. And the third thing is this, don't limit the feedback to after the fact consider getting feedback about what you do before you do it. Let me say it again. Don't limit feedback to after the fact. You're just critiquing me after the project, the presentation, the meeting, the talk, but ask for help on the front end about what you're going to do. For example, something that I do that I don't know, um, I don't know any other pastors that do this. So I'm sure they're out there, but I don't know them. I go over the talk with many team members before I ever give it because I want to know what a 22-year-old female, her perspective is. I want to know what a person who's been divorced is. I want to know, I want to get different eyes on a message before I ever get it. So I'm going to get feedback even before I give it, and I'm going to get it after I get it, and that's going to help the whole process get better. So uh, let's review last week and then dive into new content. We talked about creating an empowering culture, some big thoughts. The key to success in any organization is identifying, developing, and empowering the right people. Most leaders try to figure out the right strategy. The best leaders are obsessed with empowering the right people. Where do we find these great leaders? Remember, we don't find great leaders. We build them, then we empower them to lead. Last week, we talked about empowering leaders. How do we do this? Our big thought for last week was this. We communicate with clarity and extend trust. Communicate with clarity and extend trust. How do we know if we can trust someone the best way to trust them to find out if we can trust them is to actually trust them. How do we know if we can trust them? The best way to find out is to trust them. Why do we need clarity and why do we need trust? Clarity without trust produces fear and inaction. If we tell them, this is what I want you to do, but we don't trust them, they're afraid of failure and they won't innovate, they're, they're often paralyzed. On the other hand, trust without clarity. I trust you, but I'm not giving you specific guidelines. Trust without clarity produces work without direction. You want to frustrate some, someone, give them freedom, but no direction. Don't tell them what the win is. What does trust do? Trust is the necessary net that results in risk-taking. Oh, you trust me, therefore I can take a chance. Let's dive into new content. Um, thought number one, communicate with clarity and extend trust. The big thought for this episode is this. Guard the values and surrender control. How do we empower leaders? Guard the values of your organization and surrender control. Why do values matter? Values matter more than you can imagine. 
The number one force that shapes your culture is your values. Why? Because what you value determines what you do. Values matter, values matter. What we wanna do is we wanna give freedom within the confines of the boundaries of our values. You can experiment, you can innovate, but you cannot get outside of our values. We guard the values, but we surrender control. You have freedom to create within the values. Now, let's just be really honest. This is going to be difficult. It's been difficult for me for years. And the reason we often think this is difficult, because if I give away control, what if they don't do the job as good as I can do the job? What if they don't do it the way I think that they can do it? This is not the leader's mindset. This is a fear-based mindset, not a faith-based mindset. This is a controlling mindset, not a leadership mindset. A leader is going to think this, if I empower the right people, eventually they'll do it way better than I can do it. This is so important. If I empower the right people, eventually not only are they going to do it as good as I can do it, they're going to do it way, 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 way better than I could ever do it. Here's the bottom line. Uh, the best leaders will delegate differently than more insecure leaders. And this is a principle we've talked about before, admittedly, and I promise you we'll talk about it again. We need to talk about delegation for a minute. What do most leaders do? Most leaders delegate tasks. Go do this for me, get this done. This is how I want you to do it. I'm looking over your shoulder. I'm breathing down your neck. This is what I want done. The best leaders though, don't delegate tasks. The best leaders delegate authority. Let me say this again. Most leaders delegate tasks. The best leaders delegate authority. What is the result of these different styles of leadership? Well, when you delegate tasks, you create followers. When you delegate authority, you create leaders. When you delegate tasks, go do what you're told. You create people that know how to do what they're told. When you give them authority, you give them freedom, you, you give them the, the ability to create, then what you're doing is you're creating people who think like leaders. They take ownership. They're not just doing what they're told. They're owning the whole project and saying, I'm going to bring myself to this. I'm going to bring my own intuition. I'm going to bring my own insight, my own gifts, my own creativity. And then one day they will do it better than you could. As you do this, how do we, how do we break it down? Here's a very, very simple place to start. And I just say it this way. Push the majority of the decisions deeper into the organization. You are a leader. Push the vast majority of the decisions that need to be made deeper into the organization. You can tell the strength of any organization by how deep decisions are made. If all the decisions are made at the top, you've got a very limited and weak organization. If you've empowered people throughout your organization to make decisions freely, that reflects a strong organization. So what are we gonna do? A great goal to work toward is this. You make the decisions that only you can make and delegate the rest. Crazy, crazy important. You make the decisions that only you can make and delegate the rest. I uh, do leadership events with my good friend, great uh, teacher on leadership, uh, Andy Stanley. And he has a talk built around this whole idea where he just has people say, you decide, you decide. You decide. And this is an amazing concept. Someone comes to me, hey, Craig, what do you think about whatever? You know what? You decide. Hey, what, what do you think we should do about this? You decide. Next time someone comes to you and asks your opinion, unless it's some decision that only you can make, flip it back and say, you decide. Whenever you do that, what are you doing? You, you are communicating, I trust you. I'm empowering you. I'm giving you the authority to create something. When you give that type of authority away, people learn to think for themselves. They, they, they grow as a leader. If they're always doing what you tell them to do, they're not gonna grow. You're giving them the freedom to grow. So essentially you're saying, you decide, I could tell you how to do this, but I trust you. You got way more in you. I'm not gonna insult you. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna believe in you and trust whatever you come up with. Whenever you delegate authority, you're giving leaders an opportunity to grow. When you tell them what to do, you're still controlling. Give them the authority to, to, to decide and give them the freedom to create. Let me say it this way. Those who are controlled won't grow as leaders. If you, if you are controlling other people all the time, you're limiting their ability to grow and become a better leader. I've said it before. You can have control or you can have growth 
but you can't have both. You can have control or you can have growth, but you can't have both. What are we gonna do? We're gonna guard the values and surrender control. Uh, Zappos is a great example of a company that does this. They've got clarity and trust. They surrender control. Um, what does Zappos wanna do? Well, Im imagine a shoe company that says, our goal is to provide the best customer service. We wanna be ra crazy radical um, in, in, in meeting the needs of people in creative ways. So that's the goal. The goal is the best customer service. Then what do they do? They trust their team members to make whatever decision to reach the goal. So instead of giving them a script, like almost every other organization in that kind of field, they say, we trust you to come up with this. Here's some examples in an article I read of what some Zappos um, customer service reps did just to provide great customer service. One, physically went to a competitor store to buy a pair of shoes when they were out of stock. That's creativity and that's gonna keep a customer. One, sent a free pair of shoes overnight to the best man in a wedding who arrived with no dress shoes. You talk about creating a raving fan, that is a front lines employee who had the freedom to make a decision and that's gonna win a customer over again and again. Um, one customer service rep sent flowers to a lady whose feet were hurting after wearing Zappo shoes. These are people that say, we have the freedom to get creative, to get outside of the box and to do something, why? We know the what, the what is provide excellent customer service. The how, we trust you with this. We're communicating clarity and we are extending trust. Now, will our team members ever make mistakes? Absolutely. Well, sometimes they come in beneath our standards. Yes, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Will they do something that's not exactly right? Yes, 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 and yes. But as leaders, we would rather see aggressive mistakes than passive ones. This is so important. I tell our team this all the time. I would rather see aggressive mistakes than passive ones. If I am controlling, I'm creating passive followers. If I'm empowering, I'm creating aggressive, faith-filled leaders. What I wanna do is trust you. If you're gonna make a mistake, make a mistake doing something creative. Don't make a mistake sitting around doing nothing at all. Take some risks. I hired you because I believe in you. Go and create. So if you do what we've talked about in the last two episodes, if you're communicating with clarity, you're extending trust, you're guarding the values, you're surrendering the control, then you're gonna have a strong growing organization, right? Very easy, very simple. No, no, no. It's not that easy. It's not that simple. It will be messy. It will be challenging. You may take a couple steps forward and a couple steps back. You have to be prepared for some awkward times in the growth of your leaders to get to the season when things are humming and, and, on, and running on all cylinders. And here's the way I, I put it in my notes, is you must be willing to experience a temporary loss of excellence and effectiveness for an exponential explosion of influence. Let me say it again, think about this. You must be willing to experience a temporary loss of excellence and effectiveness. They didn't do it quite as well as I thought. That's okay. They, they, they're learning, they're learning, they're getting better. If you're willing to experience a temporary drop in excellence and effectiveness, then eventually with the right people, you will experience an exponential explosion of influence. Let me say it this way, so important. If you will empower the right people, there is no limit to what you can do through your organization. If you don't empower the right people, you are the limiting factor in, in your organization. Let me say it again, it's so important. If you will empower the right people, there's no limit to what you can do. If you don't empower people, you are the limiting factor. The strength of your organization is not a reflection of what you control. The strength of your organiz organization is a reflection of who you empower. Again, I'm gonna repeat this, it's so important. The strength of your organization is not a reflection of what you control. The strength of your organization is a reflection of who you empower. Guard the values, surrender control. Again, what if I don't trust the people? What if I don't trust them? Then either you don't have the right people or you aren't the right leader. Either way, the issue is yours to resolve. Quick review and then application questions. Communicate with clarity, extend trust. Guard the values, surrender control. 
The number one force that shapes your organization are the values that you embrace. What you value determines what you do. Guard the values, surrender control. You have freedom to create within the values. Most leaders delegate tasks. The best leaders delegate authority. When you delegate tasks, you create followers. When you delegate authority, you create leaders. So where are we gonna start? We're gonna push the majority of decisions deeper into the organization. You make the decisions that only you can make and delegate the rest. You decide, you decide, you decide, you decide. Why? Because you can have control or you can have growth, but you can't have both. Does that mean that we're not gonna make mistakes? Of course we're gonna make mistakes. We'd rather have active mistakes than passive mistakes. You must be willing to experience a temporary loss of excellence and effectiveness for an exponential explosion of influence. Last thought. The strength of your organization is not a reflection of what you control. The strength of your organization is a reflection of who you empower. What if I don't trust? What if I don't trust? Well, either you don't have the right people or you're not the right leader. Either way, the issue is yours to resolve. Two quick questions. Number one, what are three things that you're doing right now that you can delegate to someone on your team? What are three things? Name them delegate them, guess what you just did? You just empowered somebody else. You just gave the opportunity for another leader to get even better at you, focusing specifically on these very important positions of authority, creating, innovating. You're, you're, you're giving them a chance to rise. Your organization just got potentially better because you gave something important away. If you wanna move up in influence, you have to give up control. Question number two, or thought number two. Name the decisions that only you can make. This is a really important exercise. Give us some time, make a list, and the list should be really short, way shorter than you think initially. Name the decisions that only you can make. Now, name at least three categories of other decisions that you will delegate immediately. Name at least three categories. I'm no longer making decisions about this. I'm no longer making decisions about this. If you look, there, there are literally dozens and dozens of categories of decisions I used to make. Where do we build? Who do we hire? How do we do this? All these massive categories that I've now delegated to other people. Why? Because I'm empowering the right people. The more I empower the right people, the more we can influence even more people. Big thank you for listening. We'll be back again the first Thursday of next month with another episode of the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. Thank you for sharing on social media. Thank you for leading with faith and passionately. Remember, be yourself, be yourself. Be who you were created to be because people would rather follow a leader who's always real and one who's always right. Thanks again for joining us here at the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. For additional resources, show notes, or to see any past episodes, you can find all of that at life.church slash leadership podcast. Plus, you can subscribe to have all that information sent to your inbox each and every month. And if you've been enjoying this podcast, you can help us spread the word by subscribing, rating, and reviewing the podcast on iTunes. It's another way that you can help others grow in their leadership capacity as well. Plus, if you have any questions that you'd like Craig to address in a future episode, we'd love to hear them. All you have to do is send us your questions through email at leadership at life.church. Again, thanks for joining us here today at the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. We'll see you next time.